Well, I hope you're encouraged this week. If you're not, that's okay too, because our circumstances are not always encouraging. In fact, they can be downright lousy, can't they? Our circumstances? Yes? Things we walk through? The difficulties of life? Well, one thing that I've learned in the last many years is the difficulties of life don't have to take us out. There are lessons. Um, sometimes there's reasons for it. I know when I've gone through stuff that's difficult, and even at funerals that I help with, people say some of the dumbest things. They'll say, it was all for a purpose. You know, must have been the Lord's will, you know. Or even dumber, maybe your faith wasn't strong enough. Do you want to just haul off and plow them one for like the dumbest statements in the world? And people have said that to me. You know, well, God has a purpose in this. That's not what I want to hear right now, you doughhead. You know, uh, that's not love coming back at you. So have you ever experienced that? The dumb statements? I actually warn families now when I sit down with them and plan the funerals of folks during the visitation time. People are going to say really stupid things. And the worst people are the religious ones. I, I tell them that because it is true. We try and religious, or I'll use the word Christianize, difficulties. And uh, try and, and say it's a way of evangelizing or sharing faith. Well, you're not sharing faith when you're shoving it in people's face in the middle of their pain. How about just say, I'm sorry? Or, as Jesus did when a loved one died, he bawled his eyes out. He cried. We have one little verse, Jesus wept. It means he bawled, he cried, it was pain. Life is full of pain, and it's, it's going to happen again. We are going to see pain, but the circumstances do not define who God is. The circumstances do not define who you are, and something that I've learned here as a pastor is who I am in Christ is what matters. I want to take a look at something different today. Um, no, I'm not re-preaching a, a sermon from online. Um, this is... a. Uh, uh, last week, I, I, I borrowed from Steve McVeigh's Sunday preaching because it so impacted me, and I was able to teach it through my own lens because it was so exciting. I hope you get a chance to uh, go online and hear it. Um, but today, this is, this is different. Um, kind of came out of left field, hit me about Wednesday, and uh, it just wouldn't leave my mind. You've got to at least talk about this today. First, I want to tell you that God loves you. He really loves you. The world's not going to tell you that. Oh, there was a TV show that did try. Touched by an angel? Yeah. It tried to tell you God loves you. You know, with a little halo, kind of strange. I actually watched it, so I kind of liked it. But um, <laughs> nevertheless, um, God does love you. And we don't hear that message today. The message most people hear is this one. God's really ticked at you, and you better clean up your act before he accepts you. Ooh, sign me up. I want to be close to that God, right? Is, is that not the God most people hear about? Yeah. It is. He doesn't exist. He does not even exist. That false God, that lie, that God's mad, mad at the world. Well, guess what? The Bible, which is our foundation of truth, says something totally different. Are you going to trust the Bible or people? I can trust the Bible. And it says God loves you right now unconditionally. We don't hear that enough. He totally loves you. Now, growing up, I thought that was God's job. God loves you. He's God. He has to love everybody. It's his job. He doesn't have to like it, but he has to love you. Well, when you discover what love is, you'll discover God actually likes you. He really likes you. That's strange, because in our culture, our liking is based on perceptions. It's about quirks that we have that make us not like people, about how we dress. We like and don't like people based on attire, um, we, their jobs, certain characteristics. We're so judgmental, and we project that dumb idea on God, the one who is love. doesn't have it. He actually is love. That's how Scripture describes him. He is love. He is light. Those are two for sure in Scripture of God. Amen. Is light, is love. doesn't have them. He is. Okay? 
And everything he says and does is a reflection of his light and a reflection of his love. Everything. What about this verse? I don't know. What about that story? I don't know. All I know, God is love. And there's a lot of stuff I don't quite understand. There's some difficult passages in Scripture. Well, if you want to focus on, the, on those, go for it. I'm going to focus on the ones that I do understand because he's given me insight to those. I'm not going to pound my head trying to sort out something. Oh, I just, I got to understand this one. Why? Because so-and-so seems to get it. And I got to be smarter than them. Ooh, spiritual elitism. Don't let that creep into church. It's, it's everywhere, but don't let it happen here. What's the, by the way, the air conditioning is on. Okay, so it's, it's, I know it's hot. It's, it's coming. It's, it's a little slow. I should preach hellfire and brimstone right now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Crank up the heat. Great effect. All right. What? I love you, Eldon. You're a great guy. Okay. Good news. This verse we touched on last week. Romans 6, 4 says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. We learned last week that we have all been baptized into Christ. You've been immersed. That's what the word baptism means, baptismal. Immersed, dunked, doused, totally held under. You know, I've seen this great cartoon of a baptism and uh, uh, there's a wallet. <laughs> Not going down. <coughs> you can baptize all of me, but not my wallet, not my money. <laughs> kind of funny. It's uh, half true <laughs> in some ways. But you have been completely immersed into Jesus Christ. The good news is, is when you believe it, it changes you forever. That's the good news. So how do I bridge from this to the next scripture? I don't know, so I'm just going to do it. All right, here we go. Temptation of Jesus. He even made a movie about this, but not really this. I want to show you something really cool. It's a bit of a contrast message today. If God loves you and he's crazy about you, well, part of the reason why he loves you so much is because you and Christ are one. You are a new creation. That's what God says in Scripture about you and me. We're new people. We're created new. Hopefully you believe that. If you don't, you'll live like it. <laughs> Guaranteed. But here we have a temptation that comes on to Jesus. After he's baptized, Jesus is then led out to be tempted. So here it goes. This is in uh, the book of Luke. Then the devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms in the world in a moment of time. I'll give you the glory of these kingdoms and the authority over them, <laughs> the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you worship me. Huh. Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. <clears throat> then the devil took him up to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off! For the scriptures say... Who, who says scriptures say? Yeah! Freaky! He knows the scriptures! Okay! He will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Sounds clever, doesn't it? He could twist things, can he? Then Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not, test, must not test the Lord your God. And I love this last verse. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. I used to preach this that, okay, he's been tempted, now he, he was done. The temptations were over. Um, being a human, uh-uh. There were temptations that came later. But this particular text is really, really powerful. Let me show you why. He says, if you're the son of God, let the stone become uh, a loaf of bread. Years ago, I would have preached about the bread. 
Oh, he's, he's tempting him with hunger. He's, he's been out there for 40 days. He hasn't eaten anything. He's, in, he's around dangerous animals, and the angels are taking care of him. Oh, what a temptation. Here, devil gives him food. Don't eat of that food. Eat of God food. And I thought, that, that preach is good. That, you can do that. You can see that. Can, can you guys see that? I can see it. But I saw something else here, something even more incredible. And this is actually the temptation you and I face all the time. He does it three times. It doesn't say so in the second one, but it, one translation, it, it does. Um, the temptation is this. He says to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, what's he challenging? His identity. He's challenging the identity of Jesus Christ. This is the most classic temptation for all of us. And I think it's probably the greatest temptation we all face in the church. And on Facebook. And on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> okay, Rocky. That's his new name. <laughs> oh, man. You get it. Okay, a little slow. All right. <laughs> Our identity is challenged. We tend to think we're terrible when something, we do something bad. My parents grew up in this system and taught me in this system that you're a bad boy because you did something bad. My life message growing up was I was never good enough. Constantly, I got pounded. You're bad. You're terrible. The best one yet. God's going to get you. Oh, I got that a lot. I deserved it. <laughs> but I, I, I got it. He got me. He got me. He did. That's right. Thank you. He did get me. That's funny. <laughs> That's really good. She was prophetic and didn't even know it. <laughs> but that's not what she meant. That wasn't the message I got. The message I got was God has a tight hand above you and is ready to crush you because, yeah, he's holy and yeah, he might forgive you. He might love you. But right now, man, he's ticked. That's the message I got. So not only had I had parents who I could never measure up to, now I had God I could never measure up to. I went to the church, same thing from all the leaders there. The message was, God's angry. And therefore, I'm a terrible person because I behave terribly. But folks, if you can't learn anything else today, hear this. Your identity is not based on your behavior, not on your job, not on your marriage, not on your status as an individual, not on your quirks. Your identity is not connected to those things at all we have a whole bunch of jobs listed here in this place all kinds of people working in different fields of work you name it but i don't go up to uh my buddy ken back there as a firefighter the guy in the black shirt you know the right in the very back row there i won't point him out <laughs> <laughs> my brother he's a firefighter that's his job that's not who he is Okay? If he didn't know any better, and he thought his identity was firefighter, rescuer, people helper, and then if he failed at it, he'd be crushed. He'd be devastated. He can't do his job well. He's not performing well. Let's, get to, let's say he gets a poor review. Same thing. His identity, the false one, is being crushed. It's not who he is. God says something different about you, the real you, your identity, the new creation that he's created inside you, which is Jesus Christ and you as one. You're not him, he's not you, but you're one. You're union with him. Okay? All of you are in union with Christ. Amen. All of you are. This is great news. So, here we have Christ's identity being challenged by the devil, the deceiver, the liar. Here he goes through, if you're the son of God, if you're this... Jesus used the scriptures to respond back. The scriptures say, the scriptures say, the scriptures say. He could have said, I, being son of God, tell you get out of my face. Didn't do that. Because Papa, whom he was abiding in, was not giving him any extra wisdom, only the wisdom at the moment to deal with the crisis. This is the journey. Why did Jesus come? Let's take a look at this. John 1, verse 29 says, the next day, this is, now let's jump back to the baptism. This is really, really important. Remember the contrast? We looked at the temptation. 
Identity was being challenged. Anybody here ever deal with identity challenges? Absolutely. So let's look back. God actually prepared Jesus for this. He prepared him in advance. He said, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the... Oh, not just some? How about just those who believe? No, it doesn't say that. He says he took away the sin of the world. In a couple other places that it says that's really good news. He is the one who I was talking about when I said a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I've been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testified that he is the chosen one of God. God was smart. <laughs> he revealed, he, he actually had John the Baptist start his little ministry. And by the way, that was a really short-lived ministry. If you ever want to get into baptism, baptism ministry, you know, be prepared to have your head lopped off and eat locusts and honey out in the wilderness and wear really gross clothing, all right? That, that's, that's the John the Baptist uh, job description. But he sets him up so that he would reveal Christ to Israel, to the Jews. Because that's who Jesus came to at that time. All right? He came to the Jews. Then this happens. One day when the crowds were being, bapt were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. And he was praying. The heaven, as he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And this is the best part. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son. You bring me great joy. That's good news. Another trend uh, in the book of Mark, that was in Luke, in the uh, book of Mark, uh, parallel story. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, you're my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Amen. And right after that, Jesus went and was tempted. Do you catch the connection now? He knew what he was going to face he knew the temptations already in advance because he's God. He knows this stuff. And he set Jesus up with whatever he needed to deal with the temptations. He's done that for you and I as well. He's already revealed to you your goodness. He's already revealed to you your holiness. You are holy. You are pure. You're righteous. You're good enough. In simple, plain language. You are. You've been made that by Christ. This is good news. We need to remember this. It's easy to get distracted. Now, this is God speaking to his son, Jesus Christ. Where does Jesus Christ live right now? In you. Colossians 1.27. This is the secret. Christ lives in you, the hope of glory. That's where Jesus lives right now. So, does God still see his son like that? Yes? Then, imagine this for a moment you. This is God now speaking to you from heaven right now. He's saying, you are my dearly loved daughter, my dearly loved son, and, with you, and you bring me great joy. You bring me pleasure. He's speaking to you right now. Oh God, if you only saw what I'm like when I'm outside of church. I see you all the time. I'm in you. I know all your secrets, and I'm crazy about you. If you begin to believe what I see, if you begin to believe what Christ sees in you and how God sees you, those behaviors that you're embarrassed about will all change. You don't have to start stopping stuff. Okay? That's just ludicrous. All you got to do is believe. That's it. And how can you possibly, possibly believe? God gives you that gift. You can't muster up belief. That's impossible. This is amazing news. Why did Jesus come? In John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. 
Do you ever feel like somebody's trying to kill you, destroy you, hurt you, maim you, condemn you? That was never God. Do you ever think those thoughts? Those thoughts never came from God, the one who lives in you. Here's what it says in the New American Standard Bible. It says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Another translation says in the NLT, my purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. And this is the best version yet. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Amen. Can you dream a pretty exciting life? Okay, he came to do more. Much better than you can even conceive in your mind. Are you experiencing that abundant life? Don't answer this, please. Are you experiencing it? It's real, it's in you, but are you actually experiencing the joy in life of Jesus Christ right now? Some are going to say no, and that's okay. Right now, instantly, the light switch goes on. It's that quick. There is no groveling to get God to kind of clean you up like I used to do. You know, God, forgive me for this, forgive me for that, and then tell him how wonderful he is, you know, and then, and then start to, like we do with humans, right? We go and we grovel, tell them how wonderful they are. You know, kids come up to you at some, Mom, you look great. Mom, can I help with this? What do you want? <laughs> we do that with God. You don't have to. He sees you, knows you, accepts you, loves you, and is telling you right now in your mind and in your heart, I love you. Imagine if you actually believed that. Oh, the experience of my love flowing through you would blow your socks off. This is Papa God. He loves you. He's crazy about you. You can't get out of like with him. You can't get out of love with him. You're in him. He's in you. It's a pretty tight circle. He came to give you this love. Love. The definition of love. In the Greek, we have three, or sorry, four different words that are translated into love. The first one is called eros. Eros is the one most of us have heard about. You know, we get the word erotic from it. It's about carnal sexual love. Then we have phileia. Fish? Just kidding. <laughs> phileia, which is the love of a close friend. It's a friendship love. So in English, we just say, I love you, I love you, I love you, you know. But when I say to my wife, it means something totally different than when I say to Eldon. You know, he's my buddy, he's my friend. You know, it's phileia. Let me go and eat. And then we have another one from parents. The love of family relationships, that word is storge. So far we have eros, phlea, storge. These are all Greek words for the word love. In English, we just, we're so, we call it love, L-O-V-E, done. Wrap it all up. Nobody will know the difference. There's a huge difference. And then finally, the best one, agape. The word agape is the word used in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. I don't have it on the slide for you, so you can look it up if you want. But let me read this for you. Love, agape, is patient and kind. Love, agape, is not jealous or boastful or proud. Let me stop there for a minute. I'm going to go back and read this, because if you know what agape means, it really means a love which seeks only the highest good of others. It's other-centered, never self-seeking. God is agape. Okay? This, is, this describes God. It is God. So this next section, which we've used as a hammer on marriages, you must do this to prove your love. This next to-do list was never a to-do list. This is a God description list. Okay? You were never meant to fulfill this on your own. God is going to fulfill this agape through you to one another. Here he writes, agape is patient and kind. Agape is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Agape does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. <clears throat> okay, if we had those, that TV show where you hit the three stars of where you fail, if you're going to try and do all this stuff, most of us have failed already. We get the three X's, we're off the stage. Right? By now. That's not what this says. This is God. Loving on you, in you, through you. He goes on to say, uh, the irritable part, irritable part, that's right, that's where it was. Because that's kind of funny. And it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. Agape. 
It does not rejoice about injustice as in, ha ha, that guy's got a flat tire. <laughs> Sucker. And keep going. No. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love, agape, never gives up. Never loses faith. It is always hopeful. It endures through some circumstances. Oh, every, that's right. <laughs> Glasses, you know, never know. Every circumstance, love endures through every circumstance, especially the one you're in right now. <coughs> Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will, come, will become useless, but love will last forever. Agape. This is how God sees you. He is patient and kind. God is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. God does not demand its own, his own way. God is not irritable. Isn't that great news? That might be enough for some of you today. Okay, wow, <laughs> he's not irritable. No, he's not. So when we act like we are irritable, we are clearly not expressing the love of Christ. There's not a guilt trip. I'm just telling the truth. Some of you say you love each other, but you treat, treat each other like dung. You really do. That's not who you are, so stop it. It's that easy. I'm not giving you a to-do list. I'm just saying stop it. Not as a law, because a law is punitive. But as a command, I command you, stop it. A command is for your betterment. It's a disciplinary, forming, shaping direction that Paul gave us in Scripture. That's what the commands are exciting in Scripture. We get to obey them now. Oh, Wow. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Jesus uses the same word agape in Matthew 5. He says, you've heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of the Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. <gasps> Did you hear that? That's really cool. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. That means when snowstorms happen, it doesn't, it doesn't it skip over to the Christian homes. <laughs> Everybody gets it. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. Oh, by the way, it's called business. Politics. <laughs> love those who love you. Try and get your way. Manipulate the system. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you any different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if you thought you had a chance of attaining your righteousness, if you thought you had any licking chance of becoming, in your effort, good enough for God, he just blasted it. Because you have to be as perfect as God, the Father. How perfect is he? Very perfect. Yeah, he's 100% perfect. Let's say I give you a glass of water. Dan, here, this is, uh, one, uh, this is a glass of water. I want you to drink it. It's 98.9% .9 pure. The other 1.1% is a bunch of stuff I found on the sidewalk left after a dog. So go for it. Would he drink it? No. no. There's no such thing as almost perfect. It doesn't exist. It's an oxymoron. You are perfect is the good news. Jesus was speaking into the law. The law said, do this and God will bless you. And they, these Jews took the law and tried to weasel it down and make it attainable by human efforts. And they added a whole bunch of extra laws, like church, the religious church. All right? Control people. Jesus said, are you kidding? Back up to impossible, guys. So as he taught, Jesus taught law. He was the greatest law teacher. He was the greatest law teacher because he came to fulfill it. And after fulfilling it as being the only perfect one who could fulfill it, gone. This is no longer applying to you because you and I are going to die 
And we were placed into Christ at the cross, and that old covenant became obsolete. The system that said, act good, God will bless you. Act bad, God will curse you. That system is gone. It's not for you. Quit dancing with that. It's called adultery. Having a relationship with something else when you're married to grace. Stop it. No wonder the fruit of that relationship is poisonous and, and sin is punishing you. God's not punishing you. Sin does. Big difference. He's crazy about you. He loves you. Agape has to do with your mind. It's not just an emotion. If you take a look at 2 Corinthians 13, 11, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow to maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony and peace, then the God of love and peace will be with you. The then part is not the condition. It, it, it reads and sounds like a condition, but clearly it's, it, that would be inconsistent with the rest of Scripture. Okay? You've got you to gotta understand context here. Christ is in you. He's saying we're called to grow up. That's why we have the image of that tree on the wall. It's a picture of becoming a child, growing to a young adult, and then becoming mature. That's what God's called us to do, grow up. But it's so much easier just to, just being spoon-fed constantly. Oh, yeah, and praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, mm, yes, love what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, you're terrible. I'm gone. Anyway, one thing takes you off and you're gone. Fine. It's not my church. It's not. But we are called to grow up. And growing up means growing in believing God's word and what he says about you. Dispelling the myths that he's mad? No. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. When you didn't even know you needed saving, Jesus came. There was nothing you could do. You're completely depraved. There is no chance of you even conceiving, I need help. And Jesus Christ came, I love you. And you look at yourself, and go, oh, I'm yucky. He's saying, no, I see my new creation that's going to be, loves you, took you into himself, baptized you in him, he killed you, and he raised you up into oneness with him. You are a new creation. When did this happen in time and space? 2,000 years ago. When did it really happen? Before the foundations of the world. That's just freaky. I had a little girl ask me today, who made God? Let's move on to another question. <laughs> yeah. Who made him? He's always been. You and I, as created creatures, cannot comprehend outside of time very well. In fact, I don't think at all. If you can figure it out, tell me. You can make a lot of money. Romans 8, 35 to 39 says this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? What's the emphatic answer? No. Nothing can separate us from his love. Where is his love? In us and? Everywhere? Oh my goodness, it's everywhere! Which means nothing can separate us from his love. And what about, is that, that just the believers? The whole world! His love is shining through everything. In the Psalms it says light and dark are neither to him. They're alike. But his light shines into them. And he's hoping they'll say yes. Not with a little, oh, I hope so. But he's in charge of the convincing. He's in charge of the revelation. He's the joy bringer of good news. Listen to this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Circumstances can deflate your perception of God's love. Don't let it. Don't let it. Whatever it is you're walking through right now, His love is for you. As the scriptures say, for the sake, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Neither death nor life, 
Neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. Amen. What's created? Everything. So his love's permeated it all. He's got his DNA, his love DNA everywhere. Well, he doesn't have it in that place. <laughs> Oh, yeah? How, how big do you think that thing is to repel God's love? Not a chance. He's good. He's crazy about you. Ephesians 2, 4-7 says, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ. This is good news. Do you believe God likes you? Do you believe you're acceptable? Your mouth could say yes. Your brain could probably entertain the notion of no. You don't know how I feel about myself. I feel terrible about myself. I'm, I'm, I am covered in shame with my behaviors. Well, go online and watch the series on shame we did. It's on YouTube. Just look up uh, Mike Zenker, Shame and Guilt. Uh, it's a, it is a serious topic. It can hinder your perception and intimacy with God. I don't want to re-preach it because it... I, ready to go. <laughs> Romans 8.39 says, No power in the sky or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's revealed in Christ Jesus. His love is revealed in Christ Jesus. All of his love, fully revealed in Christ. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. John 15.13. And 1 John 3.16 says this, as we close this up. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us, so that also, so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Not as a have to, but we get to. We get to. There's no obligation here. It's the love of Christ compelling us. And if he get, fuels the idea, then he will fuel the power to do whatever it is he tells you to do. Some of us just need to stop and do some still time. Our lives are too stinking busy. Me included. It's crazy. Just chill and bask in the bliss of his love. God's good. He loves you. And there's nothing you can do to tick him off. It's impossible. Remember, he's not irritable. <laughs> he's for you, not against you. And if he's for you, look out anything that dare come against you. Amen. It's good news. Let's pray. Ushers, will you come? Heavenly Father, I pray your Holy Spirit does the revealing of your profound love, the one that's humanly really difficult to understand. I can't explain it. So Lord, for those of us who may have had a false concept of who you are and your love, oh, begin to redo our minds. Replace our thinking. That's called repentance. Change our thinking. Replace the errors that we've believed with truth so that we can actually act like what we believe saints holy righteous and pure thank you for your goodness amen